Thanks for downloading this episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. And before we get started, I'd like to give a big shout out to Happy Fall Magazine, who were kind enough to sponsor me when I attended the Mental Health First Aid course for adults. If you haven't heard of Happy Fall Magazine before, they are a fantastic publication whose mission is to create a healthier, happier, more sustainable society, aiming to provide information, inspiring and topical stories about mental health and well-being. They want to break the stigma of mental health in society and to shine a light on the positivity and support that should be available for everyone, no matter their situation. You can get the e-magazine for free, or you can also get hard copies that are available. If you want to find out more about Happy Fool magazine, head over to happyfool.com. Welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with your hosts, Sydney Timmons and The Secret Psychiatrist. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that we will be covering a diverse range of mental health topics that may be distressing to some listeners. You can find a full list of the topics being covered in our show notes. Please check the show notes before listening to any of our episodes. Welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with Sydney Timmins and Becky Lawrence. And today we're going to be discussing Insane, America's Criminal Treatment of Mental Illness by Elisa Roth. And their book description says, An urgent expose of the mental health crisis in our courts, jails and prisons. America has made mental illness a crime. Jails in New York, Los Angeles and Chicago each house more people with mental illnesses than any hospital. As many as half of all people in America's jails and prisons have a psychiatric disorder. One in four fatal police shootings involves a person with such disorders. In this revelatory book, journalist Elisa Roth goes deep inside the criminal justice system to show how and why it has become a warehouse where inmates are denied proper treatment, abused and punished in ways that make them sicker. Through intimate stories of people in the system and those trying to fix it, Roth reveals the hidden forces behind the crisis and suggests how a fairer and more humane approach might look. Insane is a galvanising wake-up call for the criminal justice reformers and anyone concerned with the plight of our most vulnerable. And Amazon gave it a 4.2 and Goodreads gave it 4.02 with 61 ratings and 17 reviews. Sydney gave this four stars and I gave it five. Yep. So this one was, I found it pretty heavy going. And this is part one of a three-parter. So we'll have episodes coming out on Wednesday and Friday as well. And what Elisa has done is she has split the book into three parts which we have done as well. However, we've kind of taken a different stance on it because we didn't want to just regurgitate the book to you because I don't think that's useful. Useful, exactly. I think you can read that, so that's not a problem. So we've split it up to into police, the justice system, and prisons. And so today we're going to be talking about the police section and what we picked up about America's police force. And remember, we're seeing this through UK glasses. Yeah. So, so we're not necessarily we're not necessarily aware yeah. of the system because it is different to um, what we're used to, and especially when it comes to the shootings and the statistics around that. Because obviously, we, we don't have guns, or we do well, have guns, but they're we have not ar- specific police. armed units yeah. that respond to calls. But not every, not routinely. Is no, it? you don't often walk down the street knowing that that police officer over there is packing a gun. Yeah, not even a tasers are even special training and therefore mostly only operated by the armed police forces. So you don't even have your regular police officers wear with a taser. They have their baton and they will have their gas spray, which I don't know if they use in America. Throughout the whole book, it's never mentioned. No. So they shoot first and ask questions later. But from what we again, see. this is what the book is portraying. We don't necessarily know the rest of the system because we're not there and yeah so the stories that we have read about is that it is really they turn up the police are i don't know it must be scary if you were a police officer and you've been rung up by a member of the public and they're going someone is cutting themselves with a knife or someone is has a gun and they're threatening to shoot themselves with that gun as a police officer wouldn't in some ways, that causes you, in itself, trauma and stress. Yeah. Because and, you don't know what you're walking into. And Elisa approaches this and actually says they are trained for the worst case scenarios. They are trained as warriors to go in and to try and save the day and try and predict what's going to happen. And 
make those predictions always the worst case scenario because then you know you're prepared for it which um, you can kind of understand yeah. i mean it must be extremely scary yeah when you are literally walking into the unknown other than what the person on the other end of the phone in the dispatcher has told you yeah but luckily we also see that and we'll go into some cases there are some police forces that are trying different approaches yeah. okay. which i think is definitely a positive yeah there are issues with the things that they are trying but yeah. they are trying different things which i think can only make the situation better yeah yeah and they do th- they do think some of these these new things that they're trying have actually stopped thousands of people from going t- into the justice system when they haven't needed to so if we talk about a couple of the people in the books, I think yeah. that's a really, I think that's one of the things I really like about the book is that it uses a lot of personal stories. Yeah, and it also gives us a nice point to start discussing about the book, I think, particularly because it is, a, it is where people have rung up, got the police to attend a situation, and then what happens when the police arrive yeah. in that situation. And I think that's probably a good point to start. Yeah. So the first person I wanted to talk about was Edgar Coleman, Mm. who is very well known to the police in the University of Minnesota police because he is what they call a super utilizer or a hot potter, which basically means that these are people that are picked up by the police on a very regular basis and are... Because there is no alternative, really. Yeah. It's either the police custody or it's back on the streets where they are essentially causing... Yeah. Difficulties to members of the public. Yeah. And I mean, Edgar was a draft pick for the Minnesota Vikings in the 1970s, although he never actually played for them. He studied psychology. He taught at high school and college. And then his symptoms of schizophrenia started to kick in and he lost his marriage. He lost his job. He lost his home. And so he's been living on the campus of University of Minnesota, which is why the police there are the ones that know him. And between 1996 and 2012, Elisa worked out that there were 200 arrests. For this one person? Yes. And that doesn't count the one times when police officers who knew him picked him up and just took him and dropped him off at a homeless shelter or something. That is literally just the arrest. Mm. So we're talking about probably a lot more interactions with the police than 200 in that because time. Because there's nowhere else really for him to go. Yeah. Because he was homeless. He was sleeping at the campus. He didn't have anywhere to stay. He was just, in some ways, what? police would have seen as just being a public nuisance yeah and that's the thing is that he would find ways to sneak into some of the dormitories to find somewhere to sleep like under the stairs or something he even which i found quite funny sometimes snuck into some of the conferences so he could line up in the buffet and get the food well why not i mean i think that's a cracking idea and the other thing is that again i want to point out is that he began his life before the symptoms of schizophrenia kicked in and took over everything he was a competent person. He was intelligent. He had a life. He had a mm. marriage. And he was a kind active of active member of exactly. society. It shows that... He was teaching high school kids yeah. and college kids. It shows that anyone at any stage in their life could be hit by a mental illness and then end up constantly involved with the police in some But respects. there must be a different way. I mean, if they could find some way to control the symptoms help him get a house you know help him get back on his feet because actually the only reason this ends in 2012 is because he's put into a nursing home because he's got obviously that old and um, and then 2014 he dies two years Mm. later so the only way this cycle is stopped is by the nursing home and then death Mm. which i find really sad there Mm. must be another way to stop that cycle i guess the other issue is that in obviously in america there is this issue about paying for healthcare. He's not having a job at the time, so he wouldn't be able to maintain his schizophrenia medication. And that would obviously perpetuate his behaviours, isn't it? So, and probably also the stigma around having schizophrenia and then being around children mm, as a teacher. Exactly. I imagine that those two things are... Didn't go down yeah, well, particularly especially with parents. Again, this is the stigma, yeah, isn't it? And don't get me wrong... I can understand why a parent may be concerned. It's their child that they are basically handing over to this man who has a mental health condition. However, that doesn't mean anything's going to necessarily happen, does it? I mean, you can hand over your children to members of the teaching profession that then go off and do hideous things to the kids and they don't have a mental health condition. So you kind of go, you can't really 
just assume because he's got this mental health condition that anything would yeah. happen. And actually, as a person with mental health issues, you're more likely to be a victim of a crime than you are a mm. perpetrator. And so, you know, the stereotype that actually if you've got schizophrenia, you're violent is actually is, is not true. There are a small percentage, just like there's a small percentage of people with diabetes who are violent, a small percentage of people who are with cancer who are violent. And I imagine when you're in our delusion, you know... Or having a hallucination. So, for example, the police turn up to your house and you think you're being attacked by aliens. Of course you're going to be hitting back. Yeah. Or like we see, we um, in the book they talk about the assassination of President Ronald Reagan and how the person who, I think it's John Hinckley, Mm -hmm. who assassinated him, did it because he was under the delusion that if he did this, Jodie Foster would be really impressed. The actress. Yes, which probably was never, she probably didn't even know who this person was and wouldn't have even understood that in any way it would, in some ways, be because of her that he did this horrible crime. Yeah. So it must be very difficult when people are under these delusions and they don't understand maybe what's going on. And this whole idea of the police reacting in a different way is, I think, summed up in this story about Keith Vidal, whose mum, Mary Wildersey, is the kind of the person telling the story. Keith had schizophrenia and depression. He And we say had because, unfortunately, Keith doesn't come out of this very well. Yeah. So it all started when he was 16. He got depressed. He was hospitalized. They said that he had bipolar. They put him on medication. He then got paranoid. He was then hospitalized again with the police being called to put him there. Years later, he got diagnosed schizophrenia. He then was depressed again, but now he was 18. So the only way that Mary could have him sent to hospital was to call the police because he's an adult at this point. So she can't put him into hospital. He has his own set yeah do you know what yeah what's it called he he's has got his own rights yeah that's what I'm um for. and so because of that if he says i'm not going to hospital the they can't it doesn't have to go yeah no one can make him unless, really, unless it's the police. the police so she ends up having to call the police to get them to do it and the first time they get quite a sympathetic officer who cause it's quite a small town that they live in and he agrees to go to hospital with his mum and all this Keith, though, says he's fine to all the people at the hospital. And you can't necessarily refute that. If someone is telling you something, you can't exactly go, no, I don't believe you. If he's telling you you're fine, then you have to believe that he's fine. Yeah. So they let him go. That Sunday, he thought his mum was someone else when she was there. And so his mum calls the psychiatrist. Psychiatrist says, you've got to call 911. And so get the police there again, get, have him taken to hospital. So two officers arrive. And because this is such a small town and there must be lots of little towns where this is, sometimes you get a mixture of different officers. It's not always the ones from your local town that turn up. So they had two officers, one from the local and one that wasn't. Keith then got a small screwdriver out of the kitchen drawer. He was calm, but he wouldn't put it down. Again, if you are that scared and you don't know what's going on, you're going to protect yourself. Yeah. So the two police officers call for backup. Hmm. And this is where a man called Brian Vassy from the Southport Police Department shows up. And put it this way, his mum says that she heard him say, I don't have time for this. Like My sense of beep is going to come out again. The EMT guys that were there actually say they think he heard something like, I'm here to kick ass and take names. But anyway, so he yells for the other two police officers to taser the boy. Keith turns in fear and runs into the bathroom. Which is fair enough. Again, I wouldn't want to be tasered. Oh, yeah, you just stand there and get tasered, dude. No, no, I won't. Well, he does come out of the bathroom. I wouldn't have. I'd be like, no, not not coming out. They taser him. They all rush him, and including his parents, and they're trying to get the screwdriver off him. Seconds later, Vassy shoots him in the chest. And they're like, literally 20 seconds from the time he's entered the building, he ends up shooting him. And actually, Vassy is actually held for voluntary manslaughter. He's put on trial, but he's found not guilty. And I don't understand how this can happen. Again, we're looking through UK goggles. Yeah. I don't understand how someone who has shot someone can get cleared and took that short of a time between entering the building and firing his weapon. They were all pinning him down. Yeah, at that point. Cuff him. I don't know the situation. I can't obviously comment on the situation, but why would you even need to have your gun out at that point if you were tasering him? 
The whole point of a well, taser is to drop the guy. The family actually end up going through the civil courts mm. and they get a million pound settlement. On so, yeah, you know. I don't understand. Again, he was cleared. But yet, in a different case, a civil case, he is then told that he has to pay the family because yeah. obviously he was in the wrong. Well, and this him is and the police I don't force. Because the police yeah. force are criticised for not training their officers properly. Yeah. So, but I tell you, in between 2015 and 16, almost 500 people with mental health illnesses were shot and killed by police. And that's from the Washington Post. Which is horrendous. One in four police shootings in America are mental health illness Related. victims, which is crazy. I mean, they were talking about in 2017, just from the first half of the year in San Jose, California, police shot six people, four fatally, all had mental health illnesses. That's... I don't know. It just, I don't get gun culture in America. If there are American listeners out there, please, please, please get in contact with us because I would love to understand this some more because it's just not something that we're used to here. No. Yeah. And, and the thing is, it's, and the thing is, you know, this isn't just a single case. I mean, we're only picking out a few of the stories in the book. And obviously the book itself is only picking out a few stories from what they could have talked about. Yeah. And to highlight her point, obviously. Yeah. I mean, there was another case of Dontre Hamilton in 2014. He was asleep in a park in Milwaukee. And the police officer who was called because there had been some complaints about him sleeping in the park came up from behind and started patting him down. So the man and him started struggling, which I imagine, like, if I, someone came up to me from behind whilst I was sleeping, well, you're, you're lucky that up. I didn't. Yeah, I, you're disorientated. You're not going to understand what's going on. And then someone's touching you up. Yeah. I mean, are they trying to like <sighs> who knows? rob you or kill you or something? Yeah. Particularly, I don't know, a stranger's touching me. Yeah. I would be gone. I'm sorry. So the police officer gets his baton out. Hamilton then grabs the baton. And so... Again, because he's thinking he's probably being assaulted. Yeah. Wouldn't you think that? If someone yeah. got... A, all of a sudden, now this dude that is touching you up has got some kind of offensive weapon. I don't know if by that point he should have gone, okay, yeah, they are a police officer. I'll step away. But... He didn't. He grabbed the baton. But then the police officer shoots him 14 times. Which sounds like overkill to me. And the police officer in this case is cleared of the shooting and it's declared just he was acting in self-defence. Well, I'm sorry, self-defence, if someone has grabbed your baton, is maybe to push them away, to maybe even maybe shoot them once. Why hit 14 them with the, times? Hit, hit them with something else other than a baton. I don't yeah. know. Surely there's something else... You were trained as a police officer to surely there's like tackling them or something or well, restraining them officer, or just something. Our police force would do something different. Yeah. So anyway, he is fired though, but because he but shouldn't. It's fine because he he didn't mean to kill this guy, obviously. Yeah, but he's not fired for shooting him. He's fired because he shouldn't have patted him down without declaring himself and following the proper procedures and without he didn't have reasonable suspicion that there was a reason to pat him down which i think is again outrageous because yeah. he shot someone 14 times hamilton's family actually get a 2.3 million pound settlement in the civil courts which shows you just how i don't understand america's criminal justice system no really don't and this last one i'm going to talk about happened in 2017 and it was charlene lyles who called the police because there would have been attempted burglary to her house Home, or flat yeah. and she had a history of mental health illness so when the police arrived she was scared so she pulled out a knife and the police shot her seven times in front of her three children. They later And she found wasn't out, even the person who was like... She wasn't committing she was a crime. She was a victim. Yeah. Rather than the perpetrator of the crime. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there was nothing in the book about how like they'd asked her to put the knife down or they approached her about this. They just shot her seven times in front of her children. And apparently she was also pregnant as well with a fourth child. And the police were declared that they acted within protocol. And I just, I mean, I know it must be hard, okay? And I mean, New York City Police Department estimate that they get 400 mental health related calls per day, which seems mad, which seems a lot a of lot. people, doesn't it? It's yeah, a, it's in a, crisis. Yeah, it's a big number. But the fact that, and I find this, it, I find the fact that this has to be released quite pertinent. So the National Alliance of Mental Illness, the NAMI, published guidelines on how to mitigate the danger when calling the police to help a loved one through a mental health crisis. Which you shouldn't have to do. 
in the first place. If you could see me now, I'm kind of gesticulating and I'm like, you shouldn't have to this is think about it. You're asking these How people... How not to be shot by yeah, the police. But you're asking <laughs> the police for help. And yet you have to then worry about, oh my goodness, if I phone the police to get you help, Becky, yeah, they might you might you might shoot you. Yeah. And I've got to be worried and I've got to be conscious about that. That's going to make you reluctant in the first place to call the police to get the help that you need. So you're kind of, like, <laughs> stuck either way, aren't you? Yeah. You're kind of, like, screwed, yeah. whatever happens. Well, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. There's a few police forces that are trying different things. So, so for example, in Miami Beach, they're setting up crisis intervention teams. And this came out of a court case where a man with paranoid schizophrenia and possibly high on cocaine was cutting himself with a long knife. And a family member called the police because he was suicidal. He was trying to, he was trying to take his own life with the long knife and so when the police arrive they shoot him 10 times and one thing that's pointed out is that the police are all white he's african-american but the whole court case goes through and one of the recommendations is that there's more training for police officers in how to deal with mental health illnesses when they are approaching people and these crisis intervention teams are set up And some forces are actually trying to get all their police officers trained in this. Although Sam Cochran, who is running this, and he is setting up a 40-hour training program, and he calls it slow policing. And the advice he's giving to these police officers, it's called a verbal crisis plan. So the first thing is you greet. So you say hi. Second one is you introduce yourself and you ask their name. The third point, ask how you could help. Mm. And the fourth one, Repeat back your perception of what they've said to you. Ignore any insults. Let the person pace up and down. Ask rather than shout. These are the things they're being taught. And there's role playing and all this stuff involved. And Sam says, you know, those people that want to be in that room, it's really good. And I'm not sure I'm going to say this right. Yesedro Lamoka. Yeah, I don't know how you say that. Who is an officer in Miami Beach. And I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. He actually wanted to learn more about this and he wants, he actually at the time took this woman to a hospital. They went to specific rooms. There was a fast handover, no confrontation, no arrest, no treatment because he was trained in what to do. But Sam says, if you roll out to everybody, you're going to have a lot of officers that often say, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of these, you know, nandy pandy, hands on kind of police officers. And you're like, yeah, but how many calls do you? At go to that have a mental health crisis involved. happening yeah. exactly yeah you all should be trained in this you all should be aware of it and you all should be applying it particularly if it turns out or you arrive at a situation where it is clear and obvious that the person is in mental distress yeah and this isn't just happening in Miami Beach though San Antonio police chief Leon Evans worked out that most police officers were spending between 12 and 14 hours a week at A&E which resulted in $600,000 used in overtime. And so instead, he built a partnership up between lots of the social services, the hospital, the police force, and he created what's called a restoration centre. And this is what they called a mental health mall. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's a mental health crisis centre, a sobering centre, which was basically beds where people could sleep it off, sleep it off, yeah, with a bucket possibly. Detox and rehab programs and advice on on that. There was a methadone clinic. There was a homeless shelter across the street. And you were only allowed to go in the homeless shelter if you agreed to also enter treatment. But if you didn't, there was also a safe place, like a courtyard for those people that were homeless but didn't want to access the treatment. So he thought it was social services ecosystem. And he wants to build it up more and things like that. Which I think is a good idea. Yeah. And he says, actually, what it's done is diverted more than 60,000 people out of the criminal justice system. So that would be the people such as the first guy we talked about who was this constant frequent flyer, so to speak. Yeah. He thinks that they've saved 50 million in tax each year from doing this, an 80% drop in homelessness in the area. And a 50% drop in A&E visits, which is... Incredible. Yeah. And the local jail was going to expand because they needed more beds and beds. And they haven't needed to now because of the drop in that. So that really shows that that is having an impact now. Mm. And a positive one. Yeah. Now, they might not be the be and end all because there is also some criticisms that it's not... It's not solving the problem that, you know, some people refuse the treatment. And also maybe it's just a dumping ground for people. But then what 
was there before. Absolutely yeah. nothing. So it's so, something. Yeah, there's a, now something that is there and it is proving to be beneficial. Yeah. So that's kind of the problems with the police force and some of the solutions. But that, I mean, you think about how big America is and the only two um, good things that she talked about were those two places. Now, I'm sure there is more out there. So that's kind of it for the American police force side of things. Our next episode is going to be about the court system and the judges and going through that trial process. Yeah. The last one is about prisons and jails. So when, of, once you've been convicted. Or while you're waiting yeah. to have Pris- your trial. Jails and prisons. Yeah. So jails are when you're waiting. Prisons are when you have been convicted of a yeah. crime. Unless it's a very small sentence, then sometimes you're placed back, in, back the jail. in jail. And it depends on overcrowding and so on. But yeah. we get to talk about that in the next one. Yeah. We also talk about the British system a little bit. We're hoping to get an author interview. And also do check out our merchandise that we've just got Yay. printed and stuff. So some really good stuff. We've ordered a load of bits and pieces ready to come on their way. We've got tote bags and mugs and t-shirts. <laughs> and I may have gone a little bit overboard on selecting everything. But I was like, I have one of them. Really looking forward to the mugs. You We're know. not having any. Oh. No, I've, I've got you a, a proper mug and a travel mug. Yeah, because at work, I always use a travel mug because I don't want to spill stuff over my work, but also uh, over a child. <laughs> or down yourself like you did. Oh, other. yeah, down myself. I did that in the car and then I ended up having to go to Tesco's and buy a top before I went to a course because I had tea spilled down the front of me. Which yeah. I think is hilarious. I'm so clumsy sometimes. So. Yeah, so that's what I've all done. If you do know about the guns issues in America and you want to have a chat with us, because... We would love that. Yeah, really because, because we... want to understand these things. Yeah, we don't get it. And we don't get that side of things, because as I kept saying, we do look at this system from an English or British perspective. Yeah, and because, and due to the British perspective as well, we are trying to arrange a secret policeman who... We might have in the pipe work to do an episode with us and discuss the British side of things, which will be really interesting as well. Yeah, I'm quite looking forward to that one. Yeah, so he's a frontline officer and he actually him suffered with some mental health issues himself, which he wants to talk about. So it'd be really interesting to get his perspective from the front line of policing. Yeah. So until next time, it's okay not to be okay. And if you're not okay, talk. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. If you need additional help with your mental health, please contact the Samaritans on 116-123, which is a 24-hour helpline. And if you need additional information about mental health issues, please visit MIND at mind.org.uk. Our next episode will be part two of Insane, America's Criminal Treatment of Mental Illness by Elisa Roth. Our next episode with the secret psychiatrist will be on forensic mental health. Our next book will be If I Could Tell You How It Feels by Alexis Rose. If you'd like to find out more about the MHBC podcast, please visit our website, mentalhealthbookclub.com. We really hope that you enjoy this podcast and we would like to hear what you think. Please head over to Twitter and follow us at MHBC underscore podcast or head over to Facebook and follow our Facebook page, which is Mental Health Book Club. If you would like to show your support further, please share us with your family and friends and leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts.